Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. Renew the face of your creation, Lord, pouring on us the gifts of your Spirit. Amen. On the first day of Pentecost, all the disciples, all the followers of Jesus were gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem. When Acts chapter 2 tells us that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that wasn't a one-off experience never to be repeated. Because in Acts chapter 4, 31, some few days later, these same disciples were again filled with the Spirit. Neither was this just something that was confined to the book of Acts. Because writing to the Ephesian church almost 30 years later, St. Paul encouraged them all to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5:18. While all Christians have the Holy Spirit living within them, not all are filled with the Holy Spirit. Matthew Henry, the 18th century Bible commentator, speaking on Acts chapter 1 about Jesus telling the disciples not to leave Jerusalem until they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, says this, they had already been breathed upon with the Holy Spirit, but now they will have larger measure of his gifts graces and comforts. So I want to ask you two questions. First of all, are you a Christian or a disciple and follower of Jesus? And the second question is this, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Notice Acts chapter 2 verse 4 says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of them are filled with the Holy Spirit? all filled with the Holy Spirit, not just the keen ones, not just the clergy, not just the extroverts, not just the enthusiastic ones. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, later on in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 1, Paul came across a group of believers in the Turkish now city of Ephesus. And he asked them if they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed. What he was talking about was not just that initial converting power of the Holy Spirit coming within us, but that greater anointing, that greater fullness. So they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And you know something? There's a great ignorance today in the church about the Holy Spirit. Most people that come to church, most Christians, know something about God the Father, the creator of the universe, the one who loves us, who made us for himself. We probably know a great more about Jesus, the Son, through the Gospels in the New Testament, but a lot of us have very little idea about the Holy Spirit. And if we do know something about it in terms of belief, how many of us know about the Holy Spirit in our experience? Because the Holy Spirit is that part of the Godhead whom we experience. It's an experiential doctrine, the Holy Spirit. So, how do you become filled with the Spirit? It's not so much that we get more of the Spirit. It's a case of the Spirit gets more of us. And so we begin on the bottom rung of the ladder. We begin with emptiness, desire, and thirst. Jesus said in John chapter 7, If anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. Out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit. So, first of all, if anyone is thirsty, 
let him come unto me and drink. You've got to be thirsty to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you have no thirst, if you have no desire, you wouldn't be filled with the Holy Spirit. But if you have a desire, a hunger in your heart, a thirst, you will be filled. When I was filled with the Holy Spirit, not only did I have a desire and a thirst, I had a desperation. So, it begins with thirst. So, Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, secondly, where do we go? Let him come unto me, he says. Let him come unto me. Jesus is called the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Yes, other people can pray for you. Other people can lay hands on you. But ultimately, it's Jesus who fills with the Spirit. He is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. So, if anyone is thirsty, Jesus says, let him come unto me and drink and drink. Not sip, but drink. Let him come unto me and drink cool, refreshing, renewing, energizing spiritual water. Take a long, cool drink and stay in his presence until it happens. Jacob said to the angel when he wrestled with him in the book of Genesis, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And I remember in a house in Watford, in 1974, October, lying on my bed and praying, unless you fill me with the Holy Spirit, I will not let you go. And then it happened at quarter to ten. Never forget it. So, how do we know when we're filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we know when we're filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, to put it very simply, you overflow. That's how we know you overflow. Dead simple, isn't it? You see, if I was to say to you, bring me a, a glass of water, a glass filled with water, and bring it to me from the kitchen, I bet you it would only be 95% full. That's right, isn't it? Why would it only be 95% full in case it... Because you know if it was full to the very brim, it would what? Spill over, over, spill. So you will bring me a glass of water probably 95% full. If it was 100% full, it would spill, it would overspill. And that's what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit. Not just to be filled a little bit, but to be overflowing. Here's another example. When I fill my car with petrol, and I was told the reason for that. When I fill my car with petrol, I have a very unusual habit, a bad habit, which I'm now going to stop because somebody told me why this happens. After the initial click that tells me the, the thing is full of petrol, I wait for a few seconds and I find out it's not full at all. It's not full at all. Because if I continue to press the nozzle, the little pound sign goes up to two pounds to three pounds. I can get another three pounds worth of petrol into my car. It's not full at all. So how do I know when my car is full of petrol? When it overflows. And my wife Marlon always knows when I've filled the car up with petrol because <laughs> I come home stinking of petrol. <laughs> and that's a bad thing because I know that there's a certain amount of air is supposed to, I, I was told that today, <laughs> so I'll never do it again. And sometimes the petrol will even spill out. So we know a thing is full because it overflows. So I want to ask you this, are you overflowing? To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be so full of the life of God, so full of the life of Jesus, that we overspill. You see, the Holy Spirit is sometimes called the Spirit of God and sometimes called the Spirit of Jesus. So unless we have two Holy Spirits, as I like to point out to my Jehovah's Witness friends, unless we have two Holy Spirits, one called the Spirit of God and one called the Spirit of Jesus, and we don't have two Holy Spirits, then that means that God and Jesus are the same. The Holy Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit of Jesus. More of that next week, Trinity Sunday. So on the day of Pentecost, the disciples overflowed. 
literally. They were huddled together in an upper room, frightened of the Jewish authorities that were coming after them. But when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they literally burst out of the door and went out into the streets of Jerusalem, proclaiming to everybody that they were disciples and followers of Jesus. So they overflowed physically into the streets of Jerusalem. They also overflowed in praise and worship. They started, they, they were given supernatural abilities to speak in other languages that they had not learned, and they began to declare and to praise the wonderful works of God, what God had been doing in their lives, what God had done in Jesus, how he had raised them from the dead and then exalted them to the right hand in heavenly places. And, uh, and then they started to declare to declare, to preach the wonderful things about the good news of Jesus. They overflowed in proclaiming the good news about Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and kingly power. You couldn't stop them. You couldn't stop them. So being filled with the Spirit means that we allow the life of Jesus in us to break out, to break out. Now, some of us are so self-conscious, so reserved, so private, so lacking in confidence about our faith that we're all kind of tied up and it's all kept on the inside. And the Holy Spirit longs to free us. The Holy Spirit longs to loosen the bounds that tie us. The Holy Spirit longs to in the best way, break us open so that the life of the Spirit begins to flow out more openly. You know, friends, those that know me know, and I know you'll not believe this, but it's true, that I am basically, in my personality, an introvert. Okay, I'm borderline, <laughs> but I am an introvert. If you knew one about Myers-Briggs, or even if you know me, and if there's one color introverts don't wear, it's red. Introverts don't wear red. They might have red cars, but then they don't see their car when they're driving it. They don't see the redness. And I do not... So, so see every year when I got you to wear something red? Do you know something? I don't possess one red garment. Isn't that right, Marlon? I don't produce anything green, but that's for other reasons. Ian Miller will tell you all about that. I don't have anything green, but I don't have anything red. And the reason I don't have anything red is because red is what extroverts wear. And I'm not an extrovert. I'm, a, I'm actually an introvert. Except on times like this. I'm not acting. But sometimes when I just feel the Holy Spirit coming upon me, I do, I'm enabled to do the extrovert stuff. You know what I mean? And then I go back to type again, that kind of extrovert that finds conversations, sometimes small talk, very, very difficult. But hey, ask me. But I long to be free. I want you to be free. Do you long to be free? Well, the Holy Spirit can free us up. He doesn't turn introverts into extroverts. He doesn't change our personality, but he does free us up. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul gives a list of the fruits of the Holy Spirit as well. And these are the marks of the person who has allowed the Spirit of God so to renew their thinking, change their hearts, and reorder their priorities, and open their eyes to the kingdom, that they begin to show in their life the life of Jesus. There are nine of the fruits of the Holy Spirit mentioned. There are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is interesting. So we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit tend to come quickly and initially. The fruits of the Holy Spirit grow gradually in our life. And three of the Holy Spirit's have to, fruits of the Holy Spirit have to do with us internally. Joy, peace, and self-control. They're about ourselves. But the other six fruits of the Holy Spirit are exercised in relationship to other people, other people. Love, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, and gentleness. Even self-control 
is also about others, especially the ones we need to exercise love and gentleness towards when everything within us is screaming to give them a piece of our mind or worse. We need that fruit of self-control, don't we? And gentleness and patience and kindness. And so during this month of May, we've been thinking about our giving and the fruit of generosity, particularly giving to the church as a means of blessing others and resourcing the growth of the kingdom here in Portchester and beyond. And one of the main evidences of the filling of the Holy Spirit was that the early believers overflowed with generosity towards each other and towards God's mission. For by the close of the first day of Pentecost, we also read in Acts 2.44 that all the believers were together and they had all things in common. They would sell the possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to everyone as they had need. This was not communism, where they were forced into this at the point of a gun or by government dictates. This was a spontaneous overflow of generosity. And it was repeated again in Acts chapter 4, when again they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And we read that they laid their money at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to any one of them as they had need. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul gives an example of the grace of God at work in the Macedonian church, where we read that their extreme poverty, not their poverty, their extreme poverty, overflowed, there it is again, overflowed in a wealth of generosity. That can't happen in the natural. How can extreme poverty overflow in a wealth of generosity? Jesus one day took a few fish and a couple of loaves of bread, extreme poverty, and because that, these little gifts were given to Jesus, in his hands, he broke them. He blessed them. He distributed them. He fed them. 5,000 people were fed with just a little. That's a miracle. And that is what God can do with whatever we give to him. If we can be generous even in our poverty, he will bless us. Listen, God has filled our lives, hasn't he, with abundant things. Even the poorest here today are rich in comparison with most of the world. Not only do we have everything that we need, we have much more of what we don't need. And I'll tell you why. I know we have more than we need. Go up into your loft and have a look. Why is it up in the loft? Because you don't need it. Go out into your garage and have a look. It's full of stuff you don't need. Exactly. What about all the stuff you take to the Oxfam shop? You don't need it. You've got loads of stuff, haven't you, that you don't need. But God doesn't grudge us having a few nice things in life. But what he does not want is for us to be forever hoarding and saving, but giving generously to bless others and advance the kingdom. Being generous simply reflects the character of Jesus who is within us. For though he was rich, says Corinthians, yet for our sakes he became poor. Jesus didn't have anything to give people financially. He had no money. He gave up his job as a carpenter to become an itinerant preacher. He relied upon the generosity of others. But what he did have, he gave generously. He gave his time. He gave his love. He gave his forgiveness to everyone who asked of him. He gave to the rich and to the poor, to the deserving and the undeserving, to the grateful and to the ungrateful. He gave himself throughout the day and lay into the night. He gave. And being generous reflects also the character of God, who has given us such a wonderful world to enjoy. Not just a few dozen species of birds, but hundreds of the things. Not just a few species of animals, but hundreds of species. 
thousands maybe. Not just a few thousand stars, but million stars. We don't need a million stars. A thousand would be great. But that's the generous God we have. He flung stars into space. His abundant generosity is amazing. And, and he gives for our pleasure. Because it's his pleasure to give. And when we give generously, we are reflecting the God who is in us. I nearly come to an end. Over the years I've been here, I've been very impressed with the acts of generosity here at St. Mary's Church. Many of you give regularly, week by week, or by standing order. Not only that, but you give for specific projects. Let me just mention two things. See these lovely cushions that you're sitting on, okay? Nice and comfortable. What would it be like if we didn't have any of these cushions and for the last, what, 15 minutes you'd been sitting listening to my sermon on these pews? What would it have been like? Eh? Aren't you glad for them? Absolutely. Let me tell you something. Somebody gave us a thousand pounds to buy them for you. A member of this church wrote out a check for a thousand pounds, paid for them. Isn't that great? You know how we needed a baptistry? They cost 1,200 pounds. We said to ourselves, well, let's do some fundraising and maybe we'll raise the money for the baptistry. You know something? A few weeks ago, somebody wrote out a check, gave it to the treasurer and says, there you are, £1,200 baptistry paid for. It's amazing, isn't it? That's called overflowing in generosity. With this, I close. These are exciting times for us at St. Mary's. A time of new growth. The church is growing again. New people are coming. A time when I dare to believe that God is at work among us by his Spirit. A time when we can be salt and life in our community, sharing our Christian faith with family, friends, and colleagues. So let's follow the inspiring example of the early Spirit-filled church that gave generously, joyfully, and sacrificially. Let's be a church that is investing in God's work in Portchester and beyond, a church that is as generous and as gracious as the wonderful God we worship and serve. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.